And we are joined by the wonderful Todd Alexander and Dr. Oh, Melissa Levy, who is a clinical psychologist, and I've no doubt in a few years she will be someone we'll be seeing daily on our news because she's written this fantastic book, We Need to Talk About Aging. Interestingly, the polar opposite book to Todd's, Over the Hill and Up the Wall. <laughs> and really, we, this event is called Reimagining Aging. So I want to start off by asking you both, and I'll start with Melissa first. Melissa, when you were a child, what did you imagine aging to be and when did aging start? What's an old person when you were a kid? So Jane, I love this question because I think when you're a kid and you can let me know if perhaps this was your experience, you know that when you're five and you've got a 12 year old cousin, they seem really mature and really adult. And then you sort of get to that age and you think, oh gosh, no, well maybe, maybe when I'm 20, I'll feel really grown up. And what I've come to learn is that that yardstick doesn't stop. You know, when you're sort of 20, you think maybe 50 is old. But then you get to 50 and a lot of people say, okay, maybe I look slightly different on the outside, but actually I feel really much the same on the inside. Um, you know, I feel as though I'm sort of playing at being this sort of, you know, middle age adult. Um, and what I've come to learn having sort of worked, been privileged to work with so many older people over the past decade is that that doesn't stop. Um, I've met people that are 60 years of age for whom life is contracting, it's sort of losing its zest, it's losing its vitality and its meaning, and they would say to me, I feel really old. And then I had a 101-year-old fashion designer who had her own fashion house and was still drawing, despite having a tremor, designs that would come to her. And she said to me, baby, I'm just getting started. <laughs> So I think this question of, you know, what, what is old, um, I, I think it, it really is a matter of how you feel within yourself. Um, thank you. Todd, what about you? Um, I can relate to that concept of anyone older was just old. And I think about my mum in particular, when my mum was probably late 20s when she had me, and I always saw her as being quite old. And now that I'm her age as I remember her when I was a 17, 20 year old. I look back and I look at photos of her and I'm like, my God, she was still so young then. But when aging really hit home for me, it was when my grandmother started going through dementia and my mother stepped up and took over managing my grandmother's health. And what I find really quite strange about that is as a, I was about 15, 16, I never thought to myself, well, this is the natural progression of being in a family. My mum's looking after my nan, so at some point, maybe I'll have to step up and look after my mum. We just assumed that my parents would never need looking after. And now that they're 76 and 81, boy, do they need some looking after. And I've got two brothers, and I, they're both older than me, so I assumed that they would step up. But what I didn't count on is that my middle brother would spin the globe and find the furthest possible point from where mum and dad live. And he went, Toronto, Canada. That'll do it. And then he said, well, I'm not going to live in Toronto. I'll live two hours north. And you can only approach him via Husky in the winter. So he's really sealed that deal. And my, middle, uh, my oldest brother, for he's now 56. For 56 years, he's been saying to mum and dad, I'm just too busy. And so now that they need his help, they never ask because he's just so busy. He's retired and watches darts all day, but he's too busy for mum and dad. So it was this whole concept of looking after the age that it didn't happen to me until I was probably mid-30s, early 40s, and I went, aha, uh -huh, this is what ageing actually means. I remember when I started doing some research about some articles I wrote recently for The Guardian about ageing, and I thought, oh, I wonder when does ageing start? You know, does it start at 46, which is when I remember first needing to wear glasses. Guess what? It starts in your 20s. And I wonder how many people here fear aging? Yeah, we, 
we fear being able to ride vehicles like that or, you know, what will happen to us if we come off vehicles like that. But it's such an unknown. It's one of the few things in our modern world, in a sense, that are unknown. And it brings me to the question, Todd, you know, I've said these books were polar opposite. How can you look and write about your parents in a such a humorous way because for me so many elements of aging just hurt it was a conscious decision um there are huge components of my mum and dad's life that if you allow it to would be just bleak and depressing and what i find as a middle-aged child of aging parents is that most of my friends will pick up the phone and go god guess what dad did this week god can you believe my mother's still doing this and that kind of resonated with me because people don't often talk about what it's like being around ageing parents. And so I looked at my mum and dad who both their mental health faculties are both spot on at the moment. And I know that that's a very small window of opportunity to take the piss out of them before <laughs> it's no longer funny. But what I found in my family was instead of getting frustrated with mum and dad's behaviour, I would just go, oh, here we go. I call mum Jude sometimes. Here we go, Jude's on one. And we would both laugh about it. And instead of mum being embarrassed or, you know, feeling insecure about certain things, we would get it on the table through humour. And I just found that humour allowed the conversation to flow. And the beauty of that is mum and dad opened the doors to me, not my brothers, because they've decided they don't want to be a part of it, but mum and dad, well, that's a bit harsh. They will be there when it's required. But mum and dad opened the doors to me for their ageing journey through humour, and I'm now in the club. So I can step in and help them when they allow me to, and I am privileged to see certain aspects of their ageing, and I don't feel that that would have happened had I not used humour to allow the conversation to be free-flowing. One of the things you talk about a lot in your book, Todd, is about um, medicine and going to see doctors. And I guess, Melissa, you're on another side of that in that you've probably been um, directed by medical help to, to see various patients. From the inside of that whole ecosystem, if you like, what's your take on families and what they often desire for older people? Yeah, I think, um, so it's been really interesting, you know, I've gotten to, to see so many different journeys through ageing, and one of the questions that families often say to me is, you know, what is the, the single best thing I can do, you know, to help mum and dad have a better journey through ageing, or what is, and really what I've come to learn is that it is much as you've said, Todd, and you used humour to open the door to this, it's the conversations that we're having within our families, so I think we can't change what we don't talk about. Um, and as we know, each and every one of us is going to be impacted by aging. And while it can feel like a very sort of isolating experience, and while every family's story is unique and is their own, the truth is we all share the same fears and questions, uncertainties, anxieties about aging. And while my family, before I sort of, you know, got into to this career and um, before my grandfather went through a really difficult journey with dementia. We were like most families, we never spoke about this stuff because it was scary, it was hard and no one had taught us how. So we didn't know to use humour as a bridge, we didn't have any other tools in our, in our toolbox. Um, my grandparents were all Holocaust survivors so they didn't get to see their parents age. So we were totally naive to it all. Um, but I think if we're able to start having conversations about you know, learning what our ageing loved one's wishes are for later life, I think there are three things that I sort of see come from that. I think the first is that it can create family harmony and unity and alignment, even if you end up having some crunchy conversations. Better to have them now and sort out our differences, get everyone on the same page, than do it standing in a hospital corridor, which I've seen happen probably more than you, you would imagine. Um, the other thing is it also lets us know that we have options. You know, we tend to think that because ageing is inevitable, we are powerless to change the journey or that our journey is predetermined. And that's really not true. 
we don't always have control over the twists and turns that come our way. You know, it's that diagnosis or that unexpected loss. But we absolutely have control over how we prepare for and plan for those things so that whatever comes our way, we can do our best to honour our ageing loved one's wishes and sort of have all of our ducks in a row for that. Um, and then the other thing that these conversations do that I think is so important is that it also allows us to support our carers. And Todd, maybe this speaks to your experience that when I think of supporting an ageing loved one, it's kind of like a house of cards and our carers are that sort of foundational level and everything rests upon their sort of well-being, their ability to continue to care. Um, so I think by speaking more openly about these things, paradoxically, we're so frightened to have the discussion, but it's the discussion and the conversation that ultimately relieves the fear, relieves the anxiety. Um, Yes, I think, I think that's the most important. And what about the issue of, you know, if there are differences in opinions between children or carers and older people. I'll give you a personal example, and I'm really glad my dad isn't here today, so he can't hear what I'm going to say about him. <laughs> now, I love him very dearly, but Todd also writes about it in his book about the issue of hearing why is this such a thorny issue? I get that hearing aids are not, you know, they're not a one size fit all, but one of the most interesting facts I learned recently about dementia was that, you know, there's an increased dementia risk if you don't use your hearing aids. So loss of hearing actually hastens the process of dementia. And I tried to explain this to my dad because I could see he's getting quite introverted. Todd talks a lot about hearing aids in his wonderful book. I wonder, Melissa, is this something you ever have to counsel people about in terms of, you know, a small thing? Well, it seems like that from the outside, a small thing that might be very, very helpful on a number of different levels. How do you go about those kinds of conversations? Okay, so I have a few thoughts here. Um, the first is, you are not alone. Um, the second is that one of the benefits, I was working with a couple and um, her husband got hearing aids and he said they were fabulous. And I said, you know, why are you enjoying them so much? And he says, because when, you know, she starts to get on her soapbox, I just quietly <laughs> turn them. <laughs> So, but look, and, and I think really the hearing aid thing, and a lot of these, as you said, it feels small on the surface, but I think often what's underneath is maybe there's a fear that, well, if I concede to this, what am I conceding to? Am I acknowledging that I'm getting older? Am I acknowledging that I could be losing my, um, my abilities? Um, am I acknowledging that, you know, where does my sense of autonomy and independence, you know, how does that feed into how I see my Myself. Um, so it sounds like a small issue, but, but sometimes it's not. Um, it's like a bit of an iceberg. Um, my, my advice around these things, the, the first thing is, I often say to families, it's not your job necessarily, well, if you can, you do it, but if it's tricky, it's not your job to convince your ageing loved ones to take any particular course of action. Often it's just your job to see if you can get them to the GP. So I often say, you know, the GP may not be able to give you information about your mum or your dad because of patient confidentiality, but certainly there's nothing to stop you picking up the phone and giving them a call and saying something like, you don't need to tell me anything, I just want you to know when you next see mum, when you next see dad, I'm really worried about their hearing. And sometimes when the recommendation comes from a trusted professional, someone that they respect, someone that's outside of the relationship dynamics in a family, it's a bit better received. Um, but I think um, uh, another sort of note here, maybe this is a bit of a bigger one, and Todd, you can maybe weigh in on this. One of the questions I often get asked is, when do I become my parents' decision maker? And this is a small one on the hearing aids, but there are some really big decisions, like you know, deciding when you know, a parent might need care, or deciding on where a parent lives, or deciding on how a parent lives. And I just want to say something here, that 
the decision, the right to make our own decisions in our lives, so the right to live a life that is uniquely ours, it's the right to self-determination. And that's a fundamental human right that doesn't change with age. There are certain conditions that can affect that ability, so things like dementia, but a diagnosis of dementia in and of itself doesn't rob someone of their ability to make their own decisions. Um, so I think something that I would just advise everyone is have a little think about if you did become incapacitated to make and communicate your own decisions, who would you want to make those decisions on your behalf? And have a chat to your GP or if you have a lawyer, you can chat to your lawyer um, or go on to sort of the, the New South Wales guardian and trustee about looking at appointing an enduring guardian and an enduring power of attorney and make sure that they know your wishes. Um, and often that conversation can really start to open up the discussion around d decision making um, within the family. Okay, so I have to share my hearing aid experience because I feel like I've been thrown in the deep end. My father can be three rooms away listening to the cricket at the f fullest volume and we could be out in mum's living room and if I whisper to mum and say, how about we don't have ham for Christmas this year, dad will say from three rooms away, well, it's not Christmas without ham. And so my, the other thing is my partner's from Birmingham and so he's been in our family for 19 years and every single time he speaks at any single volume, he'll turn to mum and say, what did he say? And then whenever mum opens her mouth, dad can't hear anything my mother says. So we kind of struggle between this, is it selective deafness? Is he just being arrogant? Is he being ignorant? Or can he truly not hear? And so I did convince Dad to get hearing aids, finally, after yelling at him repeatedly for 20 years. How did that go? Um, he decided that he would take on ownership of it, which was good because I was prepared to take him to the audiologist and get it all done properly. So he bought a pair from the Reader's Digest catalogue <laughs> for $23. And then when he put them in, he's like, well, this static is killing my ears which is ironic because when you get into dad's car, he'll listen to the cr cricket with so much static that it's like a little leprechauns in your ears scraping your eardrums. So obviously for dad, it was a different kind of static to the cricket commentary. Then he did go and get $3,000 pairs properly and he came home and said to me, whisper something to me. And I whispered in his ear and I said, I know I'm your favorite child. <laughs> And he said, you know I don't have favourites. And mum and I looked at each other and we literally were skipping around the house because mum has been dad's interpreter for the best part of 40 years. And mum is not a patient person. So when I say interpreter, she basically just screams at the top of her lungs, but she also enunciates perfectly as though his inability to hear is because we don't speak properly. <laughs> so when he came with the $3,000 hearing aids, we were joyous. And then about 10 minutes later, he walked out of the bathroom and I said something to him. And he's like, what? I was like, where are your hearing aids? He's like, they're just uncomfortable on my ears. So there's this constant struggle between, well, I'll hold him down and put those bloody things on his head so that I don't have to repeat myself. But at the end of the day, it's his decision. And so what Jane was saying really resonates with me. Dad is missing out on so much conversation so much, which is fine when I'm just talking to mum about getting drunk. But when the conversation's serious and he's missing out on it, you realise that he's not with the family anymore and that's really heartbreaking. And then you start thinking, well, is it hearing or is it an early sign of dementia? And when he doesn't want to talk about hearing, then what, where does the conversation go? So there are certain things I can't take the piss out of dad for and hearing is one of them. We just have to push it aside and help him through as best we can. You spoke about, um, well, Melissa mentioned going to the GP doctors, and as many of you know, that sort of thing becomes a major part of life as you get older. I wonder, Todd, how have you found your parents um, taking advice? So, for example, you know, uh, older people are often told to change their diets a bit, make sure they get lots of protein and fresh vegetables and that sort of stuff. How do your parents react to 
being told, I suppose, about you know, good lifestyle habits. Mum and Dad will very, very happily take advice when it doesn't involve changing their diet or doing exercise. And I have, I know doctors serve a purpose, please don't get me wrong, but I have strong opinions. I've been to enough appointments at doctors with my parents where diet, exercise, alcohol and other things simply are never questioned. And the answer seems to be increasingly, take a pill for this. And my mum and dad are looking for the easy option, so they'll just take the pill. And then it got to the point where dad had a hip replacement or something, and someone in the hospital said, what pills are you on? It was three A4 pages of medication. And even jumping onto Google, I noticed that medication A, when combined with medication C, could lead to this outcome. And dad was experiencing chronic short-term memory loss. And it was because of his medication because he's got 12 different doctors, one for his kidneys, one for his diabetes, one for... Ab and they're all diagnosing and writing these pills and they're all getting kickbacks for it. And when I sit in a doctor's surgery and go, well, wouldn't mum be better off if she drank a little bit less New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? They're like, oh, well, you know, she's old, it can't hurt. And it's these kind of things that I find really frustrating. And yet, when I say to mum and dad, maybe you should eat better, I'm the worst in the world because their doctors aren't telling them that, so how dare I try and step in and give them medical advice? And I find the whole thing really frustrating, but I pick my battles. So when we go to the restaurant and Dad says, I don't want the chips and salad with my steak, I call it Dad's a side salad, and he says, I'll take the chips and the mashed potato instead which is really good for his diabetes, which is why he calls it. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that we've all heard the term 12,000 times and it's diabetes. <laughs> but then I take control and I walk to the bar and I say to the nice person taking my order for dad, I'll have a steak with potatoes and vegetables, please. And come back to the table and say to dad, you know what? They just refuse to give you chips and potato. Mm. Maybe we won't come back here again. So <laughs> my, my point being, I will step in on certain things and there are other things like medications where I really, I've got a great, I'm sure you do, I've got a great bedside manner with dad now. I'm like, I should have been a doctor because I, can, I know how to convince dad to do something differently, but it's all very psychological warfare and I have to get in there very carefully and very subtly and make him see sense in what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, I, I find doctors and ageing, from my perspective, don't look at things holistically enough. Um, I look at Melissa and I know, um, I don't know, but I sort of guess that she might be the youngest one here. I don't know why I say that. And I wonder, how do you think about relating to your parents? I know you've got a while to go before they're in their dotage, but, you know, do you think about the stuff that we talk about and wonder, how am I going to bring up conversations with them about hearing aids? And I know your mum's already had some health issues, your mum had cancer, you know, but... Going forward, are you sort of storing up all the methodology and the, the tips from Todd? So look, my, and I, I'm going to add a little something to what Todd said, so I've got to loop back to that if you don't mind, Jane. Um, but I, my mum said to me when I published the book, she said to me jokingly, she said, oh, is there a chapter dedicated to me? I said, oh, mum, you're a volume, not a, not a chapter. Um, but in terms of how I'm approaching the conversation with my own parents, and I have to tell you, my parents, I mean, it's hilarious that this is what I do for a living because my parents are completely uncomfortable talking about ageing, God forbid, talking about death. Um, and it's, it's funny to me because, you know, they've been through it with their own parents um, and they've seen how sort of, you know, that that sheltering in silence really didn't work for them um, and really didn't do any service to their parents at the end of their lives. So the way that I'm approaching it with mum and dad is, firstly, I pop on the kettle or crack open a bottle of wine. Um, I think historically the mistake that we've made is thinking that because the content of these conversations feels serious or it feels important or it feels scary, that they need to be somehow formal or sterile. 
but I find actually that just increases everyone's anxiety. So have a cup of tea, have a bit of a, what is it, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? Must be from New Zealand. Any recommendations? The cheaper, the better. Great. <laughs> I think there's an Audi up the road, actually. Um, so, yeah, and, and I also find having these conversations one-to-one -one is best. I've had a few of my clients come to me and say, you know, I got invited to my daughter's place for dinner and I got there and, you know, all my kids, you know, my four kids and their partners were there and they sat me down and, you know, it was like an intervention. And don't do that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't bode well. Um, so have a one-to-one. -one. It's an intimate conversation and I think the most important thing is to know that you're on the same team and again you don't have to have all the answers but it's just about really understanding what for me what are my mum and dad's wishes for the future and how do we start planning for them now so can can I give some examples of that please do yeah so the question that I opened up with with my mum and dad I said you know what makes a good day to you like, what does a good day look like to you? Because for me, that gave me a bit of an insight into what it is that they value. And I've come to learn that regardless of illness or dementia, or we can still spark moments of meaning and joy as we age by tapping into the things that we've always valued. These things don't suddenly change just because we've gotten older. Um, and then that sort of led into the conversation of, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and age you know, in a way that was consistent with your wishes, what would that look like? And I discovered that both my parents, well, my dad's sort of fairly open to moving into retirement living. My mum is absolutely closed off to that and wants to stay home, which is possibly why my dad's open to moving into retirement living. Um, but, but I did and I discovered, you know, I always thought that if my mum got really unwell, that because my mum, as Jane said, has had cancer and myself and my brother were quite involved in caring for her during that. I always imagined that if she got really unwell later in her life that she would want us to provide sort of hands-on care because we're familiar, we're her children. Um, and she said, no, I actually really wouldn't want that. And if I required a level of care that I couldn't receive at home, that I couldn't afford, at that point I would sooner move into residential aged care and have professional care than have you and your brother sort of nurse me. I never knew that. And so what this has inspired now is we've started, they've gone to the GP and they're starting to do some of the sort of preventative health things. So we found out actually my dad ended up having a big problem with his thyroid that he's gotten corrected. My mum has problems with her heart after doing a lot of chemotherapy. So she's, you know, getting cared for under a cardiologist. But all of these things that are planning for them to have the the later life that they wish. We've even started looking at sort of finances and okay, if you want to live out your sort of retirement at home, based on your health, what do we think that might look like? What do we think it might cost? Um, and also thinking about things even like waiting lists. There's nothing wrong with putting your name down, whether it's for care at home or whether it's residential care. You don't ever have to use it, but I've had so many older people come into hospital, something has happened, there's been a big change in their health, and the doctors and the family feel that maybe it's not appropriate or not viable for them to return home. And then they're given a couple of weeks to find, say, residential aged care. It's one of the biggest decisions of their lives that they're making under so much pressure, and there are these long wait lists. So, I guess that's, for my parents, how I've opened the conversation is that it's not doom and gloom, it's about what do you want your ageing journey to look like and let's take some practical steps today to try to get you to that point. I, I do agree with the one-on-one -on -one conversation but there is another alternative and that's to write a book about your parents, <laughs> hand it over to them and say, well, that's how you make me feel and then have a conversation. It's worked for me. Have they read your book? Of course. They gave me complete carte blanche and said, write whatever you like. And I was saying this to the ladies earlier. I've created these beasts. My parents have now formed this little army of like-minded ageing people who all look at each other and go, does your middle-aged son do this to you? Is your middle-aged daughter stepping into your life? And I thought I was writing a book about 
middle-aged people bonding over dealing with ageing parents. So mum and dad call bingo. I don't know if any of you know my mum and dad, but they call bingo at Avoca, and uh, dad used to do it at Gosford. So they've been on the coast quite a lot, and they've got this loyal following of people <laughs> similar age. Now, one of the challenges of that, and I'm sorry I'm digressing, but mum and dad hang out with a lot of 70, 80, and 90-year-old people, which means there's a high proportion of those people who won't be coming to bingo next week. And so mum and dad come home and mum will go <coughs> and whenever mum does that, it's like the last post. She's got the flag at half mast and it's like, okay, well who's died mum? And then she'll go into great detail about what a loss it was that Deirdre down the club died and you go through all of the, you know what her ailments were and mum's literally in tears and I'll say, well how old was Deirdre mum? 106. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think it's really lovely that we're having this conversation, lovely that a book festival actually puts a conversation with the word ageing and not anti-ageing in the title, and the fact that we are having a really lovely open conversation here. But I often wonder how much is, of this is being played out in society. I often wonder whether society has got a problem with talking about ageing. A lot of people resort to a little bit of cosmetic help, which is, is fine, except when you look in the newspaper and you see a normal looking person, you think, oh my God! Um, the other problem too is we've got an aged care system that is very much broken, but we're not really gonna go into how we might fix that today. But what can we do to make aging a more normal thing in society, Melissa? So, you know, at the risk of, I mean, this is the, the title for the book, really, is that we need to talk about it. We, you know, we live in a society that fetishizes youth, that is so obsessed with the promise of youth. And, you know, I actually sort of um, fell into working with older people. So if I can tell a, a brief story, when... When I was doing my Masters of Clinical Psychology, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with children. And I was coming to the end of six years of studying and finally we get to have placements where you work with a real world service for six months. So I put down you know, all the best child and adolescent services and I bumped into my clinic director one day after class and she said, you know, I said, how are you? She said, oh gosh, it's really stressful finding everybody's placements for next year. And I said, oh, don't worry about me. You know, I'm happy with anything. You, you know where this is going. Found out I was going to be spending six months working with an older adult mental health service. Did what anyone would do in the circumstances. I called my mum and cried. Um, but what I realised is that I wasn't crying because I missed out on my child placement preference. I was crying out of fear. I was so scared of confronting aging, seeing older people, seeing illness, seeing loss, you know, God forbid, seeing death. It just frightened me. Um, but what I very, very quickly learned in the course of that placement, and this has held true over the past decade plus, is that our limitations around later life are often only the limitations of our own imaginings. So what I learned is that actually, and I think the systems that we have to support ageing, you're right, they are broken and they do need a lot of work. But I think later life can be a time really um, to thrive. Why, why do we need to lose a sense of meaning or a sense of joy? You know, often it's only people that have lived 70, 80, 90 years that accumulate a certain amount of wisdom, a certain amount of perspective. Um, and it just completely transformed the way I think about later life. I think also choice. Um, and this is why I feel really optimistic and really heartened about you know, what ageing's gonna look like over the coming decades. As much as we still feel so frustrated and limited, the amount of choice that is opening up for older people is enormous. Um, and this, uh, when I went over to live in New York for a period, um, I got over there, I was in my sort of early 30s, um, and wanted to meet 
people, like-minded people. So I had a look online and, you know, there were all these fantastic things for mums and bubs, but I didn't have a bub and I didn't want to be the strange woman that just sort of tags along. So I kept looking and looking and I found a program and it sounded fabulous. So they had sort of these private gallery tours for free. They had talks with the likes of Nancy Pelosi or um, the author Atul Gawande or Mitch Album. I thought this is unbelievable. They had, you know, like fitness things and nature walks. And so I went to sign up and I got an email back saying, you know, Melissa, like, thank you for your interest, but this is a group for over 60s. Um, and I said, well, look, this is who I am, and if you're willing to have me, I'd love to come along. And it was so eye-opening because, and this is no slight on bingo, but I do think we're so limited in our thinking that, you know, well, what should we put on as an offering for older people? Maybe it should be bingo. Maybe it should be line dancing. But where's this assumption that people's, the, the, the diversity of people's interests narrow just because they're older? That, that's bizarre to me. And that there's no longer an appetite for growth and learning and stimulating our brains. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and my father-in-law is, when he was 62, was told that he would need to retire. He was a partner in an accountancy firm and they had mandatory retirement. And uh, quite honestly, I was just bloody furious because firstly, why would you get rid of someone in their prime? If I need financial advice, I don't necessarily want to go to a 25-year-old who is fresh out of uni. I want to go to a 60-something-year-old that has seen it all, that's had a wealth of experience. And also, how was he meant to support himself for the next possibly 30 years of his life? So I just think the limits that we have put on what later life can look like need to shift. Um, and I got a glimpse of that in New York. Um, and yeah. Todd, Melissa said in her book that she thinks we are on the cusp of an ageing revolution. I wonder if you agree or disagree with that. You know, we're all living longer statistically and I think we don't even acknowledge that that's happening and we don't plan for what the future is going to look like. Mum and Dad, I made them move closer to us. My mum had cancer as well. Hilarious, by the way. We've never laughed so much. No, literally, we found Mum's cancer hilarious and it really helped her get through it. So again, this role of humour in really dark moments, I honestly think that that helped Mum get into remission. But I said to them both, you need to live closer to us. And they were like, oh, really? I said, well, how much money have you got in the bank? And they had no money left in the bank. And I was like, well, you have to sell your asset in order to live another 10 to 15 years. And I think we're all on this kind of life treadmill. We're all enjoying the moment. But what's my life going to look like when I'm 80? I don't know. My children live in a different state. I can't rely on them to look after me. And so one of the things I'm doing with my kids is talking to them about my parents. So I'll go back to my grandmother when she was, it was terrifying watching my grandmother go through dementia but we never discussed it in the family. It was just like, we're putting your grandmother into a special place. No, you can't go and visit her, and no, we won't talk about it. And she was actually in a mental institution for a few weeks because the doctors couldn't work out what was wrong with her, but we never talked about that. And now my kids are like, God, your mum and dad can be really annoying, can't they? It's like, yeah, I wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> but what I try and say to our kids now is, well, you need to talk to them. You need to understand that they're just people like you. They were your age once. And I think this whole concept of planning for the future, I mean, it's inevitable that a large proportion of the people in this room are going to end up in an aged care facility. Have any of us lobbied aged caring about what food we're going to be getting, what kind of qualitative care we're going to be getting? We just don't even think about it because we're putting it to the back of our minds. And you know, I look at someone like Maggie Beer, who's one of my personal idols, I just love her. Anyone who was in my talk yesterday will know that I want to be Maggie Beer. <laughs> but what she's doing for aged care is so simple, but so magical. She's looking at food and the quality of food that people get in aged care from a nutritional point of view, but also variety and quality. And it's little things like that. 
that we all have to address as a society instead of just assuming that, oh, when we get there, things might be better for us. We need to shake the system up now before we get into it and it's too late for us. And Jane, if I, if I can just tag on to that, you know, I think something that I've observed is that idea that with the right education and planning, 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 and that's why these conversations are so important, that we can have a much greater voice in how we age. So I love that you're talking to your kids about this now and also that for them it won't be such a taboo subject. You know, look at the, the changes we've had in mental health literacy and why can't that change around ageing as well? Um, and we, our options are definitely expanding. So I think we need to lobby government. Um, and maybe there's not time for this now, but I can give you some reasons as to why I'm actually really optimistic about what the future might hold. Um, what I might do first is I might prepare you all because I always think these events are the best when we get lots of questions and particularly hard questions because you've all come here for a reason today, I, I expect. But before, so you can get your questions in order, I think the microphones will be in order too. And before we throw to questions, I wanna ask you both quick uh, uh, response from each of you. How will you reimagine aging, Melissa? You know, to me, I, I think of the, the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley, and the last two lines of that poem say, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. And what I love about that is that we're so different, each and every one of us, we've come from different walks of life, but I'm yet to meet someone who whose wish for their aging journey isn't to remain the author of their lives. We all want to remain the author of our lives. So my sort of way to reimagine aging is that we open the conversation, everyone knows, you know, their loved one's wishes, and we create more and more choice within the aging sector so that everyone can have their own journey. Thank you. Todd, how will you reimagine aging? I see my aged future in a big house with lots of like-minded people and a lot of very good-looking aged care workers coming to tend to my every need. Clothing optional. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Todd Alexander and Melissa Levy. So yeah, I am hoping, and I can already see a few hands raised, so hit us with your questions. Um, maybe the elephant in the room in deciding our future, as, as one of those people between 17 and 90, is voluntary assisted dying. I have visited friends in dementia wards locally, and there is no way I'm going through that. I have my little stack of pills at home, and if it gets to that, I'd rather take it, but it'd be lovely if it be illegal. So is your question about dementia or dying? Uh, dementia, ending up with no control over your bodily functions as a vegetable, what is the point? So did everybody hear that really uplifting question? <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, do you want to try that one first? And I'll be naked, so <laughs> no. no um, I'm all for assisted dying. I think that... Um, the challenge of that is that often the decision will have to be made after you're capable of making the decision. So it's like, okay, well, when do you step in and take charge of your own destiny and say, now's the time for me? Uh, I can definitely hope for a future where that becomes a reality. It's already happening around the world, and I think Australia will catch up at some point. So I've got a few thoughts on this. I'll try to keep it concise, because this we could have a whole coffee yes. over this. Concise, so we can fit in lots of questions. Perfect. So my three main thoughts are, the first is that often when we think of dementia, we do think of people who have sort of lost control over their bodily functions. But... And, and that is very, very distressing, and I see where you're coming from. But I also want to just note that in this looking at sort of the, the broader population of dementia, that, that's only a small subset of people that perhaps reach that eventuality. So I think the first thing is to say that a diagnosis of dementia doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you're always destined for. Um, often there are sort of different journeys that people have. I guess my second thought is, and it's about what Todd said around 
The current legislation, at least in New South Wales, is that you need to have the cognition and the decision-making capacity to decide that you want to participate in voluntary assisted dying and no one else can make that decision on your behalf. So like an enduring guardian, a legally appointed substitute decision maker cannot make that decision for you. So as you so rightly say, so then what happens in dementia? Based on the current legislative framework, a person with progressed dementia is not legally able to request or participate in voluntary assisted dying. Can I just add one thing about dementia very quickly? The science shows that in some areas, the prevalence of dementia is coming down ever so slightly. And do you know why that is? Because of lifestyle change. So people who start eating a sort of Mediterranean style diet, exercising, that actually can reduce your risk of getting dementia. So while the overall news looks very depressing because of course more, there are higher numbers of people getting dementia, there is this window called lifestyle change and in particular areas of Australia, of Britain, the prevalence is coming down. So that is good news. Another question, please. Uh, yes. Um, I've enjoyed both your, your talks about ageing, uh, but it's mostly been from the point of view of family and children. And as an ageing gay man in his 80s, sitting here with my husband, uh, slightly less ageing than me, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, particularly to Melissa, um, and I will definitely buy Todd's book, uh, because I want to go into that home with him. Oh, I've got, I've got your number, don't worry. Uh, but Melissa, um, should we buy your book as well? I think I want to, but is there much in there? She's going to say, no, don't buy my book. No, <laughs> definitely not. No, you see where I'm coming from? I do, yeah. I do. So look, and I think that's a really valid question. So this book was, and it says it in the preface, just so you know I'm not making it up on the spot. Um, the book was written, the sort of target audience was for carers. So typically for children of ageing parents, but it was also written for older people themselves who were still wanting to sort of take control over what the future might look like. So what you might find helpful in here is there's a lot of really practical prompts around what sort of questions should you be asking your GP now? What sort of legal appointments should you be considering um, in terms of substitute decision making, advanced care directives, what are your options for the future if you require care? What are sort of some financial considerations? So you're absolutely right. It was written predominantly um, with sort of carers in mind, but it's also very much for older people themselves who are still in a position to sort of, you know, become the sort of captains of that ship. Yeah. What's your name? Uh, Bill. Bill. Melissa, do you notice Bill's body language? He's got his arms crossed and his legs crossed and he's making me really worried. <laughs> Bill's a pussy okay. cat. I met him yesterday. <laughs> um, but Bill did raise something that I was, and I'll be very brief. Uh, I've read recently that for gay people moving into aged care, they're having to come out all over again because there's this um, expectation that you know, single men moving into these things must be widowers and, you know, must be straight. And I think that that is something as a society we have to really work on and be conscious of because we've been fighting our whole lives to be accepted for who we are and then in our last 10 years we're having to do it all over again. And can I also add to that that in terms of things to look into, in terms of care, you might find that there are, and you may not want to entertain residential care, but whether it's care that's coming into your home, you might want to look specifically for organisations that do reflect your values and that, that are more inclusive. And so, yeah, I think um, ha have, a, have a browse and decide <laughs> if you want to buy the book. Um, Bill... I think you should put your name down for Todd's yeah. residential my, care. My home. residence is opening very soon. <laughs> yes, there will be unlimited wine. As I said, clothing optional. You must kiss my pig on a daily basis. It'll be lots of fun. 
Helga's home. Yes. Um, we have another question. Yeah, hey everybody, it's been beautiful to be here and grateful to be a part of the discussion with two slightly aging parents and one grandmother, final grandmother in aged care at the moment. Um, I'm actually studying with the International Nature and Forest Therapy Alliance and there's been some studies done on trees that are part of our Australian environment that actually have these things called phytoncides, which are part of the immune system of trees and they actually have been proven to help support dementia. So they're seen as a public preventative health me measure, basically, when you're immersed in a forest environment and you're breathing in these chemical compounds that they have a holistic health effect on people who are aging. So I'm just curious, I guess, from a holistic perspective with you both, like, I guess, around nature immersion and how that can help with an aging population. Guess who's just got a job at my residency? <laughs> Do you want to add? You. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not familiar with that sort of specific study, but I, I want to raise maybe a couple of things. I think the first is we know from a lot of studies looking at stress and inflammation throughout the lifespan that being sort of immersed in nature is just good for your stress response. It sort of, you know, decreases cortisol, decreases adrenaline. So I can imagine that that would very much endure in later life. Um, and I can imagine in dementia that also being in an environment that is serene, that is less stimulating, might also help with sort of, you know, mental clarity and orientation and... Um, and speaking to some of the points that Jane made earlier, so there was a big paper that was published in The Lancet, which is a really prestigious medical journal, in 2017, and it was revised in 2020. And it showed that up to 40% of all dementia cases are due to modifiable risk factors. So we once thought, you know, I remember a, a client's son said to me, dementia, if it's going to get you, it's going to get you. And I think that was the thinking for a long time. And certainly, sometimes it is a roll of the dice. And certainly, there might be sort of a genetic component in certain types of dementia. But this was a really exciting study because what it goes to show is that there are things that we can do. We're not sitting ducks. We can be proactive. Um, and some of the biggest factors is, and I'll just summarize them crudely, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So that's where the Mediterranean diet, exercise, if you've got diabetes, managing your sugars, if you've got high blood pressure, high cholesterol, making sure they're in healthy limits, things like social interaction, nothing stimulates the multi-centers of your brain quite like socializing. You've got to use your working memory to remember what someone said. You're using your language centers. You're using your frontal lobes sometimes to inhibit socially inappropriate responses. My dad's relishing in the fact that he now sort of says inappropriate things and says, oh, frontal lobe deficit, frontal lobe deficit. Um, and, you know, mental stimulation, learning something new. So if you learn something that your brain can't currently accommodate, it stimulates neuroplasticity. It forces your brain to make new brain cells and new connections, and that makes your brain more resilient to dementia. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's new. We've got a question in the man in the blue. Man in the blue. Uh, yeah, j just um, slightly away from that, because I guess a lot of us have been speaking about um, old, older parents and everything else. So for the boomer generation coming through, of, of which I'm at the end, end part of that, um, how do you think society um, is having to be changed now because like the Jane Fonders and all that that are leading it at the other end are saying, no, this isn't going to go down the way that it was before. They want to have a different way of looking at it. People coming through in the boomers, they might be 70, but they feel like they're 50 or 40. So they have a different way, they're doing the Mediterranean diets and everything else, and yet society still discriminates. In fact, they want to keep working through to their 80s because they can. They are lucid, they are looking after themselves, they want to make their own decisions, they want to say, that, yep, I've had enough, now I want to die. And that's why the um, whole dying thing is now coming forever, because people want to be still in charge. They don't want to be going back and treated like kids um, when they're going into a nursing home being fed um, you know, slop and everything else, and, and then just slowly drifting into drifting into death. 
Um, I'll just jump in and say, I see this almost daily with my parents. It's just so easy for society to put you in a box. You're old, go to the doctor, take a pill, you'll be fine. And my parents have bought into that wholesale, and I have to keep challenging them. Have you considered going to see a dietitian? Have you considered doing this? Because my parents' generation is, for most of them at least, whatever the doctor says is right, and I'll just do what the doctor says. And I think what Melissa was saying about social connection is really important. If you're not talking to your 75-year-old neighbour about what's working for them, then you won't open yourself up to new opportunities and new possibilities. And then I feel like for us boomers or middle-aged kids, we've got to challenge our parents' thinking. It's pretty ingrained after 80 years. Why don't you try something different and not just accept the status quo? And I, I think to that point, sorry, I think to that point that... You know, I think when I look at the dynamics of my, my Jewish grandparents thought that a doctor was basically the closest thing to God um, and that, you know, becoming a psychologist, really, what a shame she didn't do medicine. Um, but, you know, I guess what is changing, the dynamic that's changing, and I encourage you to run with this, is that yourselves, you are no longer the passive recipient of the care that you are being given. You are no longer a passive, like a passenger along the journey of later life. You are in the driver's seat. You should have the loudest voice in determining how you want to live these years of your life. And to have that loud voice, one, find a great GP. Find a great GP. They become your portal for everything. And in terms of not ending up on three pages of meds from the every ologist, the neurologist, the cardiologist, the endocrinologist, the, you need a fantastic GP who's going to almost be like the symphony conductor of your health care. You need the people closest to you to be really clear on your wishes and to be really bold advocates of your wishes. You need the legal documents in place to support your wishes, and that's going to give you the best possible chance of living and dying on your own terms. Oh, and never research anything on Google about your own health. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Melissa and Todd, and please reimagine your own ageing.